Thank you for tuning in to From Book Bans to Inclusive Education. I'm Joe Wilkes, editor of The Thread, New America's in-house digital editorial platform and monthly newsletter. We launched The Thread in 2021 to showcase the talent of New America's staff and elevate stories that connect policy, equity, and culture. Since its beginning, we envision taking these impactful stories from the page and bringing them to a live audience. This event came together as a partnership between a thread and New America's education policy program on a timely topic that is close to our heart as storytellers and researchers, making the case for diverse books and inclusive education. In this event, you'll hear from two panels on the origins of book bans, the importance of diverse books for student success, and how we might safeguard access to these materials for all. We apologize that there were technical difficulties during the event start that prevented the video from picking up audio. During the outage, our first panel, How Diverse Books Set Students Up for Success, provided a brief overview of the history of book banning and how similar tactics are used today. You'll be jumping into the first panel a couple of minutes in. The panel is moderated by Adam Harris, a writer at The Atlantic covering education and national politics, and the author of The State Must Provide, a narrative history of racial inequality in higher education. He is joined by an order from left to right, Maika Mulit, social media manager at New America, Howard University PhD candidate and young adult author of books like Dear Haiti, Love Aileen, and one of the good ones, Ravita Raman, parent and a co-founder of One Will Co. in Williamson County, Tennessee, and Natasha Tarpley, fellow in the Learning Sciences Exchange and acclaimed children's book author. Her works include I Love My Hair, The Me I Choose to Be, and so much more. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. But I think children's books are that place um, where you can connect all of the pieces of who you are. And, and that's what I hope to do in my work, to encourage kids to kind of explore these many pieces of who they are, their interests, their concerns, their fears, their loves, their passions. Um, and so for me, that's, that is really the beauty and also the tool of resistance that I think children's books offer. Um, because they are a way to connect someone with their own source of power, which in, in this context is often very dangerous. Um, and just a note on history, the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about in this context of banned books is, you know, how, especially in the African American tr tradition and, and other traditions as well, books and other written materials um, were very closely tied to activism and very closely tied to a call to action. Um, so if you have uh, a newspaper, you know, take for example the Chicago Defender that was disseminated across the country and encouraged black folks in the South to migrate north. Um, if you have even something like a black book club, um, these kinds of places were gathering spaces, were places of discussion that kind of activated people's minds. And if you think about Black Book Clubs now, I think this is one of the, the resources that can be very helpful to us in this banned book discussion. These Black Book Clubs are huge. So they not only are spaces to talk about literature, but they purchase books. They have buying power. And they often have activism associated with it in terms of going out into the community and connecting with other groups and children especially. So all of these kind of pieces to me are, are very much connected. Absolutely, and you know, actually to, to your point about, um, you know, there have been these efforts in the past to try to ban books, but they have not been successful. Or if they have, it's been for a small period of time. And then, you know, the, the um, folks who are fighting back against those who are censorious um, uh, ultimately end up winning the day. Um, and I think that's, that's an important point because, you know, we often center those who are trying to censor rather than those who are fighting back against those censors. And Mike, can you just talk a little bit about the, the importance of doing that, right? The importance of thinking about those folks who are really pushing back against the censors. Yes, so something that Natasha actually just mentioned, it sparked um, a scholar, her name is Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, 
and Dr. Bishop talks about books, especially as it relates to young people, being a place as mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And so the idea is that as a young person is reading a book, they might see themselves reflected with it as a mirror. They might be able to see somebody's experience that is different from theirs, where they are seeing it through the window. And then they might have the opportunity to step through and actively engage, and that's that sliding glass door component. And so when we think about book bans and how they have happened in the past, we very often look at the bans that have happened, but we don't really examine the individuals have been, who have been successful in overturning those bans. Um, and also, when we consider these things, there are very specific ideologies about who has power and who remains in subordinated positions when we center certain voices as we talk about book bans. So in highlighting the bans that are successful, we are more pre um, often highlighting predominantly white, predominantly conservative families who don't want these texts. But then that means that people who have identities outside of this don't have their stories reflected. And we know through uh, media studies that the way that we interpret the world is very much impacted by the books we read, the television that we watch, the films that we watch. They help provide us with the language to grapple with the very real circumstances that we have in life. And so although a book might be a work of fiction, it actually carries real world consequences. And um, for me as well, as a young adult author, I co-write with one of my sisters. Um, that is something that as an author, especially if you have a marginalized identity, you carry this with you in your work. And it's not um, something that you, and I'm speaking generally here, but you don't go into it with a level of callousness that I'm just writing the story for the sake of writing the story. There absolutely is that element, but then there's this understanding that stories featuring people who look like you, who experience the world like you, have not always had a space. And so that is very important for us because it becomes not solely an educational issue, it becomes a political issue. Absolutely. You know, I, I've been thinking, um, as, as you've, you've all been, been talking, right, if, you know, we've been thinking a lot, right, in education circles and education spaces, just generally about um, chronic absenteeism recently, right? And one of the ways that people combat chronic absenteeism or one of the things that um, gets students engaged in school, um, there's some research that showed that if you have a, a teacher um, that looks like you within the first three to four periods of the day, you are more likely to be engaged in school, right? It, it has a tail as, it, as the day goes along, but that importance of sort of seeing yourself um, uh, in, in those spaces, it, it proves important. And we already know that books featuring diverse characters are already a slim um, fragment of, of the market. Um, but, but, you know, Ravina, I, I wanted to, to talk to you about what you see sort of on the ground, right, in, in Williamson County. How has this played out in, in your county, right? And how have you been able to fight back against some of this? It's been a challenge, and I think um, we are currently um, experiencing a lawsuit in our district now against uh, certain books. Um, I actually got to participate on a panel with um, school books, um, a fifth grade book called, um, oh, it slips my mind uh, at the moment, but um, it really talked about the Civil War and the woman's role in the Civil War. The River Between Us is the name of the book. And so I was really, you know, um, I shared with you all about my experience at the plantations and telling one side of the story. So I really came into that book review kind of feeling like I'm not going to like this book. And um, when I actually read it, it was such a good book. And it told a perspective <laughs> about the uh, Civil War that we often don't hear, which is the perspective from a woman's aspect. We always hear about the men who were fighting and the young boys who were fighting, but never that. So, but it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. And so I think, you know, even with the cost of book bans, it's just gotten to be uh, very expensive, a lot of man hours. We're doing this in areas where we already don't pay teachers well, and then we're taking all of this time away from where we could to apply to these book reviews that our district ended up, um, you know, after reviewing all those books, they ended up keeping them on the, on the shelves. And then we had a group of families that came in and have now sued the district. So it just makes it a little bit more challenging when you're doing that. But we 
um, our community has done a really good job by showing up um, at the school board meetings, being present, and just um, being open to have conversations about these and why it's important for us to continue to remain engaged and show up all the time. Yeah. Um, and Natasha, I actually wanted to ask you a similar question about sort of student success, right? Thinking about how seeing yourself reflected in your um, in the literature that you are consuming, um, sort of it can instill a sense of pride, it can instill a sense of history, it can also just teach you new things, right? Because it's, sometimes it's not just the students who um, are trying to see themselves reflected in the stories, but it's the students who may need to learn about other cultures um, that are that you know people are trying to take that away from them. So can you talk a little bit about um, what a diverse set of books um, actually does for, for students and for children? Yeah, I mean, I think stories in general help us to form connections with other people. When we can share our story, we have a sense of, of, of ownership, of contribution, and then we have other people who can kind of reflect back to us and say, oh yeah, I, I went through that, I experienced that. And unfortunately, what really um, I think is a tragedy around these book bans is that, as you were saying, Vita, that it just, it makes us kind of fit within this paradigm so that those sources of connection are interrupted and they're blocked. Um, so that's, that's one thing, but I think the diversity overall um, for me, it's important to not only see, you know, racial diversity, but also diversity within groups, diversity within, you know, how people live their lives. And so that, that's also very important to me because I'm often very frustrated by the depictions that I see, even of black uh, children and children's literature. Um, and so I think book bans offer us the opportunity to kind of ask some questions about well, what are the stories that we want, that we want to tell? How, to, how do we want to engage with each other's stories? Um, what, is out, what is not being shared that, that we need to share? And kind of focusing on our own, the resources that we have. You know, and I think we attach a lot to books and they're very important. But the other thing about it is that books are a vehicle. Books are a vehicle for that source of sharing. And so I think we need, to off, we need to kind of hold that very dear and understand that when you are in the world, that you are a source of that connection, that you are a source of, of that sharing. I mean, we just had a conversation sitting over there about you know, racial disparity and it's just like, oh wow, you know, I never knew that, oh, I never knew that. So those kinds of interactions um, happen beyond books, so I think, when we're, we're thinking about book bans, we need to address that very directly, but we also need to very, be, be very conscious of the resources that we have individually as well as um, collectively. Yeah. Can I add something to yes, that? Yes, absolutely. I think, um, and what you touched on, I think a lot of times, one of the things that we had a talk with our district about was you know, the materials that we currently have often depict African Americans during points of trauma. Yeah. And that's not our only story. We have so much more uh, positive things to tell. So just trying to highlight, you know, even during the our 28 day Black History Month, mm -hmm. um, of being able to highlight, you know, other things other than the same traditional people that we often hear of. So trying to expose and share information about other opportunities is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And actually, um, Mike, I wanted to ask you that same question about this sort of narrow lens, right? You know, thinking about when when we have the broader conversations. Naturally, it's like, oh, well, you know, you're you're banning teaching about history, or you're banning teaching about, you know, but it, it's looking at you know Black American history or Latin American history, right, through a very narrow lens and thinking both historically and in the present moment. Kind of, can you just sort of sit on, sit with that for a moment, right? How how that limits our understanding of what literature can offer us and what, as, as Natasha was talking about, how we can connect with that literature and how we can connect with each other. Yes. So when people say representation matters, it's not just a catchphrase that we are saying. It's because when you see yourself reflected on the page, on the screen, it lets you know that your experiences matter, that your voice deserves to be elevated to the point of the main character, the focus. And so when 
we have book bans that are occurring, it's essentially helping us to reinforce who remains in the subordinated positions in society. And if you don't know, um, if you don't see yourself reflected in the stories, then you are less inclined to read. And so if you are less inclined to read, the opportunities that you have later on might also decline. It's not only a matter of you know, having people have access to different stories that they might not necessarily know about. It's being able to engage and critically examine the work that we have. Um, you know, sometimes we are very often talk about wanting young people to get to you know, the hollowed, hollowed halls of academia, <laughs> but in order to get there, in order to get there, there has to be um, a stretching of that critical thinking muscle. And a lot of that comes through reading books. You are going through a very introspective journey when you are reading a book. It's just you and the text, or if you're listening to the audio. And then as time progresses, you think about yourself in the role of the main character. You navigate the experiences that you have. Oops, sorry, I'll touch the mic. <laughs> you navigate the experiences that you have, and then tie it and find the commonalities with someone who maybe looks entirely different than you. Um, also, the books that are frequently banned, they very much um, target topics around sex and sexuality, but we also have books that, talk, um, that target you know, black, black stories, um, Jewish stories, stories from marginalized groups. And when you even examine, if you go out there, we have a table that um, we are, thanks to um, Jasmine, she was able to share so many books from her personal collection of banned books. You'll look through the, the topics there. You know, you have things about accepting your queer identity, learning critical language, all of these things. And when you look, you say, these are the books that you all are banning. These are the things that you don't want young people to understand. And it's because it's helping folks to have the language to then engage with one another, to be uncomfortable in that discomfort, in that learning process. So I can go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know, I, I wanted to, to sit with, with you for, for one more second, just because, you know, as, as an author, right, how are you thinking about this as you are writing books? How are you thinking about your audience as you're writing books? Because, you know, being, you know, you write with your sister, you said, and but being, you know, being an author can sometimes be a, it's a very solitary experience oftentimes. So how are you thinking about um, both this moment, but also just these ideas more generally as you are writing? And, and Tasha, I'll have the same question for you. Yeah. So the first book that my sister and I wrote was called Dear Haiti, Love Elaine. And we wrote that story because when we were growing up, our parents were very strict and we weren't allowed to watch TV during the weekdays. So we would go to the library every weekend and max out on the number of books that we could read. And diversity at the time was white girls with red hair. <laughs> so we read like um, Pippi Longstockings and Nancy Drew and all of these wonderful books that even though we looked nothing like these characters, we were still able to find so many commonalities. And so writing Dear Haiti Love Elaine was our, our opportunity to take a story that was not personal to us per se, because Elaine comes from a very wealthy family and we do not, but, <laughs> but being able to highlight the experience of a Haitian American finding her identity. And then um, our second book, one of the good ones, grapples with the history of oppression in the United States. And it talks about, you know, we talked about like these intra-group dynamics, how sometimes even within community, we will in reinforce some of the hegemonic statuses. And then our most recent, Excuse me, our most recent work is called The Summer I Ate the Rich, <laughs> which is highlighting um, just class inequality. So I very much take this into the work that I write, but I also make it entertaining. It's fun. Um, and that's the balance that you have, like just being able to maybe educate folks, but most importantly, to entertain and see yourself as the main character and worthy of that focus. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's. Kind of, that's exactly the, the approach um, that I take as well. I think it's really important to have entertaining stories. Um, when I first started writing for children, uh, way back when, um, many of the books that I was seeing that featured African-American children or that were about African-American subject matter were often very heavy. They, um, to me, felt, you know, as Rita was saying, very traumatic. There's a lot of trauma going on. And I really wanted to interrupt that a little bit. Um, I Love My Hair became kind of this hair book that people embrace and, and you know, feel good about in terms of their hair. But for me, it's also deeper than that. I mean, it's, it's important to have that kind of self-esteem. 
but for me, it was really embedding that intention of kind of a, inviting kids to really celebrate who they were beyond just the, their physical characteristics. I wanted to create a book that was filled with a sense of joy and whimsy, um, and that also really prioritized this little girl's relationship with her mom. In fact, that was the inspiration for the story, um, the, the moments that I shared with my mom when, we, when she was combing my hair. Um, as I was saying earlier, these books that I was reading I'd read all the Pippi Longstockings and all that <laughs> stuff. And we learned very, very quickly to project our experiences because even if we're having those experiences in our lives, they're not often depicted in the books that we're reading. And I still think we have a ways to go with doing that now in the current publishing climate. It's getting better, but I think there's still a ways to go. Um, and so for me, it's very important to embed those intentions and those invitations in whatever I do. And, and also to tie it into a, a sense of activism, again, going back to that, that sense of actively reading and engaging um, with yourself, with the world. So there was I Love My Hair, um, which was a celebration of this little girl. There's another book that came after that called Bippity Bop Barbershop, which was a book my publisher, in fact, asked me to write for boys. So, you know, publishers are like, oh, this one did well for girls. So let me, let's get one for boys. But even that was prioritizing um, that community relationship, the barbershop, the father, the son, uh, what goes on in those spaces uh, in that really primary gathering space uh, in African-American communities. And other books really engaged with how kids could take the gifts and the talents that they have and bring it out into the world. Um, for example, uh, my picture book, Destiny's Gift, is about a little girl who uses her love of writing um, to try to save a community bookstore that's in danger of closing in her neighborhood. So she becomes the memory of this store and tells the story of why this place is so special and how kids can use the things that they have to make a difference in their community. Um, so I always try to kind of sneak a little of that in as well. Absolutely. Um, Ravita, I, I wanted to go back to something. And actually, to the audience, uh, we'll be opening up for questions shortly. Um, I have a couple of more questions here. Um, Ravita, I wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier um, about the, the sort of cost of, of all of this, of, of book bans, um, both in terms of the financial cost for the district, the man hours, um, uh, the, the amount of, of time that you're just generally spending on going through and doing the reviews, um, but also in terms of, of the learning environment in the community, right? Um, right? So, so can you just talk to me a little bit more about the cost of, of these efforts to ban books and both how um, it, it sort of wears on the community, but also how it can bring people together as they're fighting back against these efforts. It has been so um, welcoming to connect with um, people who are on the same page mm -hmm. in, um, in this journey that we've had against banning books. So, um, you know, we've got several librarians that are in our community. Um, I met a librarian um, recently, and she was just talking about, you know, in Tennessee, you know, we have all these laws about penalizing them or putting the librarians in jail. And she was like, you know, we are the quietest, most docile people. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not trying to, to sexualize kids or anything. So I think a bad rap kind of um, is pushed upon them because of this. But the districts are, you know, with, when you think about the man hours, I think one article that I was reading, it was over 200 hours that have been put into the community. And you have several people that are putting time into this. And so when you calculate that, I can't remember if it was Texas or Utah, but it was like $100,000 is what it was costing this school district. And I'm not sure about you all, but my school district can use a lot of the resources in other areas. I'm recently, like probably in the last week, the state of Tennessee um, decided that $1.9 billion in funding is federal funding is not going to come to us because of different concerns that they have. We need that. Our schools need that. Our teachers are not being paid adequately um, already. You know, so we every time I turn around, the PTO is asking for money for something. We have resources that we already need that we're having to apply 
to this for a political agenda. So it's really frustrating that we're having to to do this, but it's something that our community is really standing against. I've been very proud of the um, advocacy and the support that we are having, um, but I hate that it's at this um, expense, but it's definitely good to be able to connect with like-minded people um, on one accord. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Natasha, you know, there's been a, you know, as, as this has become a sort of more national issue, there feels like there's a, a misunderstanding about what books kids, students are actually reading at what age, right? Um, can you just talk to me a little bit about the levels that, that the different levels of children's books, right? And, and you know, going from a, a ch child's book to a young adult book to, right, to a, a more advanced book and, and how that difference, um, what that difference actually signifies um, to, to um, authors, to publishers, and, and how students are actually receiving that um, information. Yeah, and please uh, and jump in too. As well. yes. yeah. But I think a lot of it is tied to um, the curriculum that kids are uh, learning in school and also developmentally. So if you have like pre-K, there, there are a lot of, of board books. Um, so developmentally, you think about a kid holding a book or biting, biting a book and things like that. Um, and also the stories tend to be, you know, pretty simple. My um, my picture book, I Love My Hair, and the Bippy Bop Barbershop book were both, that both have um, board book versions of them. And so it really kind of... Um, Pick up my keys. <laughs> <laughs> We all have it. a it's real all right. life parent. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's okay. But it really, I, mean, I think it really is based on, you know, kind of developmentally. Um, picture books uh, can ge generally be used I've, up to probably third grade, kind of traditionally, people are using picture books. But then when you think about it, picture books are. Uh, appropriate for all ages. So there's, it's hard to say, you know, which books are appropriate at which age. Um, and then middle grade, um, that's generally for kids who are, you know, getting in, into that more advanced reading. There's a, there are chapter books in between there, which kind of bridge the gap between the picture books and getting into more complicated stories, more complicated vocabulary, and then getting into middle grade books, which thematically get a little bit more complicated. Um, as well as the literature, um, you can do a lot more in terms of themes uh, and, and the types of things that you can cover. I, I'm a prude, so I tend to um, err on the side of, I'm not really that interested in doing uh, sexual content or really um, traumatic, hard stuff for kids. Um, I really like the idea of kids getting a break. I think somebody said that. Um, and kind of really having a fun when they read. So for me, not to say that I don't tackle things, but it, it's for me that um, that's really important. But I think YA, uh, you have a lot more room to deal with more serious subject matter. And you can talk about that one. Yes. I've never yes. written a YA. Yes. So essentially the different categories, we like to think of young adult, middle grade, um, early ed books as if they are the genres, but that's just the age designation and making sure that the content within the pages are developmentally appropriate. And so um, also, you know, something that comes up in the scholarship is that very often as adults, we tend to um, essentialize children. We like to think of them as these young beings who have no um, real world experiences, but they are watching and they are observing. And there have been various studies where scholars have been able to mock a, a town hall where people want to ban books and have the students play the role of the parent who wants to ban, the role of someone who doesn't want to. And they are able to critically engage in these discussions. And furthermore, when a book ban occurs, it really sparks the curiosity of the young person. I definitely remember when I was in high school, we were reading romance novels we had no business reading, but it was because we were essentially, you know, trafficking them as stolen goods. We're like, go read this quietly and don't tell anyone. And so this is something that has not gone away. And in fact, when we push these book bans, we are then creating an environment where it's other young people grappling with these texts with one another and their level of 
uh, knowledge around the topic is usually around the same place. So it's very uninformed people leading uninformed people. Whereas teachers are skilled in this. You know, we wouldn't go to a doctor who is prescribing us, like, this is what you need to take and say, are you sure, doc? You know, all those years of education that you went through, do you know what you're talking about? So um, our teachers are very much equipped to handle this, but we're dealing with um, a lot of issues in this regard. And finally, one thing I would say is that, um, you know, books in particular, they are sites where culture wars are waged because of the power that they have in allowing us to grapple with the world. And libraries in particular face this tension where they are, um, you know, why they might not be beholden to advertisers um, in the way that a lot of um, organizations are, they are partially taxpayer funded. And so they are grappling with this duality of wanting to be a place of intellectual freedom while understanding that at any point, if someone does not like what you're talking about, your funding might be taken away, and then there goes that space that is so important for us as a community. So. Absolutely. Um, so now we would like to open the floor up for question and answer. We'll have a microphone coming around, and we'll also have some questions online. Um, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. Um, I think we have one right here. Thank you so much for this discussion. Um, hi, Rita. I'm with the Education Trust. Uh, and you touched on this, Natasha. A, a big issue for, for us in, uh, in a report we recently released was finding that even when we see diverse books in classrooms, the characters that are included from marginalized groups are often negative in their portrayal. They're really limited in their presentation. And when we see topics discussed that disproportionately affect these populations, like racism, like climate change, they're sanitized and minimized to ways that really don't allow students to understand the topic outside of that book, mm -hmm. you know, to connect to their own experiences. And right now, so much energy is dedicated to just combating the bans to books. So I don't know if maybe from some lessons from history of successes against book bans, or Ravita, your um, close work on the ground in, in schools, like what lessons uh, or what direction might we be able to take this to shift the conversation back you know, towards the important work that far preceded this ban, right? towards increasing diversity and making it much more better in terms of representation? Yeah. If I could share a little bit on that. Um, I think a lot of times we have um, groups that are looking for their own agenda. And so it makes it really difficult to try to get it back on target. And one thing that One Will Co. has been successful at doing is um, continuing to be a present in the room and continuing to try to spread um, a narrative that we feel needs to be spread. While we do have these outside forces that are bringing up these other topics, it's like you have to redirect it constantly. So for me, that's one of the ways that we try to, to deal with that um, is by sharing another voice or that could be writing an editorial or an op-ed to try to redirect those conversations. So that's one way that we can kind of look at it. Yes, and some, that's part of my dissertation. I'm in the middle of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Something to keep in mind is very much like that idea of framing and how we have these discussions in the first place. Um, it's really important for us to make sure that when we are talking about the books that we are helping to move the narrative forward in a way that is not staying in the book ban. You know, that was, you know, something I alluded to earlier, like even when we talk about book bans, we talk about them within an educational context, which is very important and true. Um, However, it extends past the classroom because all of these um, uh, narratives that we are not getting access to or that we're getting the sanitized versions of, it then impacts when someone does get something that is a closer reflection to what has actually occurred. They're like, well, that's not how I learned it. And so there is this um, battle, but you know, there are successful groups who have been overturning these bans. Um, there are young people in particular who are pushing and attending school board meetings to help talk about why they want these bans to um, be reversed. Um, there are authors who are 
um, getting, becoming litigious, right? They are going after um, state school departments to be able to um, overturn the bans as well. And so whenever we talk about book bans and we only focus on the bans that are occurring and we don't raise the overturns or overturning of these book bans to the same level of attention, then we are reinforcing the status and the status quo. I also think that um, this kind of moment that we're in allows us to kind of go back, as you were saying, go back to history and see what kinds of things worked and kind of reframe our ideas of what activism means. I mean, we need people in all of the sectors and all of the pieces, you know, the lawyers, the teachers, the activists, everyone needs to be a part of this. But again, going back to that idea, we also should value the power that we have to communicate with each other. So engaging kids with what they're reading, does this reflect your life? Does this feel like it's something that, you know, is respectful of you, is respectful of your experience? How do you feel about this? I wish that, you know, every school visit I go to, I tend to ask those kinds of questions. The last school visit I had actually was a library visit, and I was telling the, the children that I write about uh, black kids or that I like to feature African-American kids because I feel like a lot of the work that's out there about our experience, as we've discussed, is very narrow. It doesn't incorporate all of the wonderful things that you guys like to do. You know, one kid came up to me and he's like, I'm having a birthday party for my hedgehog. <laughs> and so it's, you know, creating spaces where kids can express who they are, uh, regardless of what the book is saying, or using the book as a way to, to kind of talk back, is, is this something that feels good to you? Is this something that feels right? And in terms of activism, I think there is a movement here that also needs to start up with our criticism and engagement of the publishing industry. And I'm not you know, putting down any publishers, but I think there has to be a way, I'm not sure where the, what the um, process is of deciding, you know, this is how this community reads or this is what this community values. Um, I'm old enough to remember back in the 90s when there was a direct shift from more literary texts, when you had people like Alice Walker and Toni Morrison, um, there was a real movement of black literary um, fiction. And then all of a sudden, it was black urban fiction. Mm -hmm. It was these very, um, even stereotypical situations. And every publisher was saying, oh, well, we want to engage black people. This is what they're going to read. And I'm like, well, what studies did you do about that? Who did you talk to about that? And so I think there's a real um, opportunity to use our buying power, to use our you know, intellectual and social power to engage with that kind of structure as well and to say, hey, we want to have more diversity on, the, on this level as well. So. Do we have um, questions online? We got a question online, yeah. Um, what organizations or efforts can school librarians reach out to for help if they face community or municipal bans? Yes. Um, one of the studies that I read talks about uh, an NCTE um, and how they have these resources for teachers to be able to tap into, to be able to learn about how you can go about um, combating these bans. So some of the recommendations that they have is when you have a text that you want to present to the class, one, reading it yourself, but then also going through and the, any parts that might be, you know, part of um, concern, really highlighting why you think this book is instrumental for discussion and critical engagement in your class. So that means preparing beforehand, which of course translates to more work for the teacher, right? But there is this level of, um, and sometimes also the study's fine, and we'll talk about this in the second panel, is that because of all of these bans, you're finding that teachers are censoring themselves. School boards are censoring themselves. And so when you decide that you want to be the person who is presenting these books, it becomes uh, an act of planning, where you write the reasoning and the rationale. You talk with your principal, depending on what the situation might be. Maybe you tap into a lawyer, but all of these, of course, are dependent on resources, time, um, human power to get it done as well. 
Um, and then I believe I was, well, in the next panel, we'll talk a little bit more of that and have some opportunities, so stay tuned. <laughs> we got time for one more question, if there is one in the room. Another in the room? I have another one online, if not. Oh. Um, okay. okay. Um, how is it that a handful of parents have been able to make blockbuster noise to ban books that they believe don't impact learning and support American history? And I think this question is specifically related to groups like Moms for Liberty and mm -hmm. the like. Yes. So when you examine the history of book bans, it, the, that Texas um, banning that I mentioned earlier where they were looking at the history books and deciding we're going to change these things, it was led by one organization. And so what that organization did was provide the template for future organizations to do this outside of the historic or textbook space into what we are seeing now in the you know, literary or the fiction space as well. Um, so these organizations are being funded by individuals who have a lot of money, who have a lot of stake in maintaining the status quo, who have a lot of stake in making sure that certain groups are not represented politically, et cetera, et cetera. So these individuals are being um, uh, bolstered in that regard. But um, there was something that Natasha mentioned earlier, and that's something that I highlight in my work as a critical scholar, is that even the everyday person has power when we come together and we are able to say, hey, if this is just one parent who has this objection and 20 of us do not, we, if we are a democracy, right, when we say we're ruled by the majority, then we have this opportunity to come together and say, while this person has this concern and they are valid in perhaps how their child is receiving this information, it should not translate into a ban for all of our children, especially when we know children from um, his, um, historically marginalized backgrounds are not reflected in the work that they, or the books that they read, which then has lasting ramifications. We had, um, in our district, we had a um, group that I won't say their name, but um, yeah, I frustrated to. about <laughs> uh, seahorses because they're teaching gender fluidity. And I'm going, oh my God, like y'all love God, but y'all are mad about God's creature. So it's so frustrating. I've often been um, accused of blessing people with seahorse earrings. That's my, that's my thing now, that's my animal now. Um, but you know, I just think it's just, it's so frustrating um, and very insensitive to um, parents who want to have deeper conversations with their children when you can't have a conversation with your child about the male seahorse having a baby. Or I think they, at this time, this group was banned, they were frustrated about a book that talked about the deaths from Katrina. Those are natural things that we all have to learn how to communicate and conversate on. We have to have hard conversations with our children. But just because one person does not want to have that hard conversation doesn't reflect on everybody else. And that's what we have to keep in mind when we have these people who are trying to stifle the opinion of others based on their limited um, access to information because I have conversations. I have difficult conversations with my children all the time because they're gonna get stopped by the police and they're gonna have all these other things that they will face and I need to prepare them for that. And just lastly on that, I think you bring in a really good point about kind of the nurturing that needs to happen. I think the impact of this on children of all races, but especially those who are being banned, whose experiences are being banned, and who are seen to be less important because we want to protect, you know, the sanctity of these other children's emotions and their experiences. That's another whole piece of it. And how do we nurture and support those kids? And also within that context, that's also going to help shift the dynamic, I think because once we can chip away at these paradigms of continually fighting these stupid administrative bans and we really start to care for one another, I think we can, it's not gonna solve the problem, but it can start to chip away at some of these issues. Absolutely. And of course, there's so much to discuss, but we're gonna have to leave it there. So Maika, Ravita, Natasha, thank you so much for a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Adam. Thank, thank you. you.
Um, moderated by, by New America's own Lisa Guernsey, the director of the Learning Sciences Exchange and a senior fellow and strategic advisor in the education policy program um, with a work focusing on open and inclusive education as its core tenant um, and the author of Tap, Click, Read, Growing Readers in a World of Screens, a look at the importance of libraries, librarians, and ecosystems that provide a full literary landscape to kids and families. Welcome, Lisa Guernsey, and our second panel. Great, right. and yes, please, my panel, panelists, come on up. Hello, everybody. Um, that was such a fantastic discussion that we just had, and I'm ready to, to kind of dig in here because this next panel is one that's going to take, take all of that kind of great richness from the first one and then help us continue what the Q&A was getting us into, which is how do we activate that? Um, so the, the title of this particular panel is the approaches that can promote access to diverse educational materials. And we are broadening it in this conversation so that we certainly are talking about books, print books as well as ebooks, but we also want to think of and talk about instructional materials of all kinds, including those that are digital. So it's, you know, it's time for us to recognize we're, we're in a digital age. There's lots of ways to be using new materials with kids in ways that are enriching them and, and that are showing them the full diversity of our, of our country and our experiences. So I'm going to take a minute to um, quickly um, name our amazing panelists who are here, but then I'm going to have each of you um, introduce yourselves fuller with that as well as answering a little question for me. Um, so what we've got um, with us today are folks who really understand these issues on the ground because they work in schools and with educators. So to my left is Kyle Zimmer, who was the CEO of First Book. And First Book is also the backbone organization of the Diverse Books for All Coalition, which we'll hear about in a little bit. Um, we have with us Becky Henderson, who is at the Westmoreland Intermediate Unit in Pennsylvania and who um, works with educators across many different uh, districts. And as well, we have um, Masiahu Israel, who is um, a professor of education at the University of Richmond, has been a social studies um, teacher in Virginia. I first got to know Masiahu through some reporting that we were doing on social studies standards in Virginia, um, and who also is the, um, the co-host or host of the Leading by History podcast. So thank you all so much for, for being with us. Um, we've just heard really a, you know these powerful powerful examples and reasons for why students and, and children um, need access to the this the diversity of, of books out there and i wondered if you might take a minute to just um, tell me a little bit more about how you're connected to this issue but then how you've worked to make sure that the students that you're that you're working with have access to these books and educational materials. So I'm going to, let's see, I think I had a specific order here. Yes, I'm gonna start with you, Becky, in the middle. Um, and then I wanna go to you, Masiahu, and then Kyle. So, but Becky, please tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you're making sure this is gonna happen for our kids. Yes, thank you, thank you for having me. I'm Becky Henderson. I am a curriculum services supervisor at Westmoreland Intermediate Unit. And in Pennsylvania, intermediate units are educational service agencies. We are one of 29 and we are under an umbrella organization called Pennsylvania Association of Intermediate Units or PAIU. In education, we really love our acronyms. <laughs> um, However, what we do is all things related to teaching and learning in the curriculum services team. So anything that we can do to support our school districts. And in Westmoreland County, we have 17 public school districts that we serve, as well as I think approximately 42 non-public schools that we also serve. So anything that is coming from the State Department of Education, anything that our school districts need support with, we are there on the ground level helping them out. Now, at the state level, I also am helping to co-lead, I am one of two co-leads for our Open Educational Resources Initiative that we have going on at the state. It is very much a grassroots movement. For anyone in the audience that is not aware, Open Educational Resources are openly licensed, available instructional resources that can be used in the classroom. So they can be either digital or print materials. They can be any format. 
that you can use in the classroom. And the best thing about them is that they can be really manipulated, modified, adapted to meet the needs of your specific student population. So they give us a lot of flexibility. So when our textbooks can be very rigid and uh, very formulaic, these resources give us the ability to adapt and modify to meet individual student needs. And so that's where I come into play. Fantastic. So we'll get a little bit further as we go down the line. I want to hear a little bit more about how to use those kind of openly licensed materials for this kind of work. But Masiahu, let me go to you. Yeah, Masiahu uh, is Raul. And um, I wear a lot of hats in the education world, um, supporting school districts um, in their social studies programming, uh, particularly uh, the University of Richmond working with teacher mentorships uh, to support teachers in the classroom so we can keep our teachers, you know, where we need them most, right, which is in front of those students. And then also uh, the founder of Leading by History, which is a collective of educators uh, from around the Central Virginia area who work to support uh, school systems to provide training, counseling, et cetera. And we have a podcast by the same name in which uh, the attempt is to bridge the gap between K-12 education and higher ed. We know that teachers don't have the ability sometimes because of the weight that they have on their shoulders to read thousand page books uh, and be able to be up on the cutting edge of every single piece of history. So what we attempt to do with our program in Leading by History is to bridge the gap by bringing the scholars, the folks who are really on the cutting edge of research in history, social science, and, and world events to the stage to have a 30 minute to an hour conversation. So within that time, educators can listen, be up on the latest and greatest research, and be able to transfer that back to their classrooms and their schools. That's the work that I do. Yes, and, um, and we'll be ready to hear about some ways that I'm ready to hear about some ways that you've been able to use those kinds of connections to really get into some of these really tricky, tricky situations that the teachers might find themselves in. So Kyle, and then we'll go to you in terms of your kind of connection to this work. Sure, I'm Kyle Zimmer, I'm president and CEO and one of the co-founders of an organization called First Book. Um, it has been dedicated to educational equity. It's a nonprofit ded dedicated to educational equity for I think we're in our 32nd year. Uh, and we have really approached our work on equity issues for kids in need by through sort of two different lenses. One is by listening. At the heart of our work is a community, an online community of 575,000 educators and program people, Title I classrooms and homeless shelters and every other setting you can imagine. Uh, and we really listen to them to the point where we've built a uh, research arm called First Book Research and Insights that now is generating uh, about 20 studies annually to, to really aggregate and amplify the voice of this critical group of people. They have never been uh, hesitant to tell us how important diverse books are in the lives of the kids they serve. I, I just, even years ago, there was, uh, we ran a, a significant survey that showed that over 90% of the respondents uh, told us that they knew that the kids in their classroom would be more engaged readers if they had books that reflected their cultures and their lives, 90%. And so we never ignore a response like that. And so we've had waves of uh, work in the area of to promote diverse content. Uh, but, but the second lens, and this is a primary way we've addressed the need for diverse books, is by really focusing on the, the need for market strength and to use market leverage because there's actually, as everyone in this room and certainly everybody online knows, there's an enormous group of people who want these books, who love these books, but we have to make that market visible and valuable to the publishers. Uh, yes, this conversation is about black and brown, but it's also about green. And so First Book has aggregated that market on behalf of the community we represent. And in 20, 
13, for example, we established something called uh, uh, diverse, or, or we established something called the Stories for All Initiative, where we we brought together about a million dollars worth of buying power on behalf of our community, and we launched an RFP to the publishing industry saying the publishers who step up with the highest quality, most diverse content, we will make significant purchases from you because we wanted to plant the flag and say there's a demand for these books, there's a market for these books, and we're putting money on the table. You can find our Stories for All initiative on our first book marketplace, which is our e-commerce site that uh, provides free and low-cost books and all kinds of educational resources, including digital, uh, to our, our uh, community. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, we move 15 or 16 million books annually through this system with a very, very significant push for diverse content. In fact, one fact that I found out yesterday, which I love, is that in 2022, 88% uh, of the orders that came through the first book marketplace included diverse content. And so we're really there to increase accessibility and to push the price down and the relevancy up. So what, I, what I'm hearing, and, and we certainly heard this on the first panel, is that there is absolutely demand for, for these materials across all sorts of different kinds of stories and ethnicities and, and backgrounds, um, as well as parents wanting these, you know, it's not just that educators are, are looking for them, but parents do too. Yeah. And yet, we are at this moment where there are, I mean, I was hearing, hearing it described the other day in a, in a webinar that really what we have may be, um, there's some hard bands out there, but actually more pernicious may be the soft bands, where there's a bit of self-censorship happening, where educators are just not so sure they're going to put that book on their syllabi this next year, because they just aren't so sure they want to get that call, or they're not ready to kind of deal with whatever anger might might come out. So how are we going to kind of square this where there's there's demand we're seeing and we're also understanding how much this matters for student success in school um, and helping children learn to read and yet we are are, are finding that, that teachers are feeling um, squeezed or, or kind of putting themselves in these kind of soft band situations. I wonder if I might go to each of you to Tell us a little bit about how you're navigating that and, and, and thinking about strategies that our, our audience may be able to use as well um, because we have to recognize everyone's in different contexts and there, some folks are coming from areas where it's not going to be so easy to stand up and say, yeah, sure, I'm going to put this book on my syllabi. Um, so who might want to take that question? What kind of strategies are you using? Well, I can step up and talk about the two studies we just ran. Uh, because I think the way we're navigating it is trying to inject actual data into the national discourse on this, which has been, uh, may I just say, largely fact-free, right? And uh, so we've run two studies, one we just released today, I believe, uh, and that deals especially with what you're describing. I'm going to look at my notes because there are a lot of numbers, and I want to say it correctly. Just a few of them. We'll Just a few. More. Uh, we released today a study of 1,500 educators uh, showing that nearly two-thirds of them responded that book banning is having a negative impact on their ability to teach. 71% said that book banning undermines their expertise, makes them feel distrusted. And 72% said that restricting book access decreases student engagement in reading. This is really important because only a third of the, of the respondents said that they were actively under, in a district where book bans were being, uh, uh, you know, laid down. And I, uh, so it shows the chilling effect that you're describing, and I'll hold my fire on the other study we read. Well, we heard it here first. This you is did. breaking news. You did. It's thrilling. It's um, thrilling. And, and the fact that that's across, uh, 
a nationwide survey yes, of, yes, of teachers. Yes. So we're talking about those from districts that are rural as well as districts that are suburban yes, exactly. as well as that are urban. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So if with that set up then, now you guys get to you know be the solution to it. <laughs> to this. What are what are the strategies for co coping with this? What teachers are facing right now? Well, I think that overall when, when you talk to teachers they very much understand and are very passionate about wanting to put resources in front of students that meet their needs and that are best for students. Instructionally, emotionally, they know that they need to do what is best for kids and they want to do that. I think part of that is providing them with high quality professional learning experiences that help them to understand how to do that. Mm -hmm. Because part of it is they're a little unsure as to how to find the correct resources, where to go to do that, and then how to have the conversations with administrators and with their community about the intention behind the resources that they're using. And I think that that is sort of the gap that we need to bridge right now. So what we have been trying to do in Pennsylvania is talk about open educational resources, talk about the training that they need to have to find the correct resources, where to go to find those resources and vet them, how to make those modifications, and then when they select a resource, how to have the conversation around why you're selecting that resource with various stakeholders so that you can discuss all of those concerns that people can have from a broader standpoint. Because when you have the conversation, it becomes much more transparent. I selected this resource. It met these needs for students. It didn't meet these needs. I made these modifications because I understand the content and I understand my student population. And when you can do that, it can become a very powerful experience for student learning. And, and to just to have you elaborate just a little bit, Becky, um, these resources can look like what are we talking about? Books? Are we talking about lesson plans? Are we talking about prompts for writing? <laughs> so open educational resources can actually be anything. They can be all of that. They can come in the form of a full-blown textbook. There are open educational resources that are textbooks. There, they can be lesson plans. They can be just individual activities. It, it can be interactive. It can be a static worksheet. There's so much that's out there. Um, one of our favorite places to go to is always OER Commons because there's so much in that one repository that that's the first place we always send teachers to go, but there are so many websites out there that they can go to that it can be a little overwhelming, which is why we always go to one place first, because that's where most of them tend to be funneling through anyway. Um, but really, if you think about what teachers do in the classroom every day, when they have a resource that doesn't meet their needs, they tend to create their own anyway. And those yeah. are also open educational resources. So if they're already doing this work, then we should honor that. We should talk about what they're doing to meet the needs of their students and name it for what it is and help them to understand what they're doing and why. And so how about you, you must yeah, here. Tell yeah. us about kind of how you've managed this. Yeah, so there, there are a, a couple ways. Um, you know, number one, the issue is that people are yearning for conversation. And um, how do we have conversation about things that are extremely delicate, right, um, without, quote, rubbing people the wrong way and getting into, you know, a tit for tat uh, struggle over words, right? I've always said that the real, if you, if you study human psychology and the behavior of human beings in sociology, that folks generally don't argue over truth, right? So, it, it, you know, if, if I say, you know, this is a podium, most people will be like, okay, no problem. But if I say this is a lion, uh, immediately you start to feel like, wait a minute, where is he coming from? What is he saying? So there are trigger responses when we engage something that we don't understand to be true, right? So then that requires a dialogue. Because I can either say, you're crazy, man, that's not a lion, or I can start posing questions. So one of the things that I have helped teachers with as I work with um, you know, divisions ar around the Commonwealth 
is a model for engaging challenging conversations with confidence. Because that's one of the, the issues that is that uh, many times teachers aren't feeling the confidence. Should I choose this book? Uh, maybe there's nothing wrong with this book, but what if there is? What if I end up in the news? What if I end up on TV because of this? And a lot of times they end up second guessing themselves because we haven't, we haven't empowered them with the tools to have conversation. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you would do is, you know, in the model that I, that I developed for having challenging conversation is, is you can enter it at any of the four stages, but the first thing is to, to get a handle on what the motivation is for the conversation. Do I want to talk with the person who says this is a lion because I just want to make them look bad? And I want to prove to them that this isn't a lion, right? I need to get the motivation. I need to then set clear expectations for the conversation. You know, um, is my expectation, again, to make you see my point? Or is the expectation for me to learn? Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People says we must seek first to un uh, understand before we seek uh, to be understood, right? So these are, these are things we have to trigger ourselves into this process. We have to um, also be very thankful for a conversation that gets heated. And I think that's a missing element in most of the conversations is that generally when I've had challenging conversations with parents or folks from the community who have had concerns, even if the conversation doesn't go the way that I would want it to go in the end, I'm genuinely thankful for the opportunity to step my game up to figure out ways to connect and get understanding. And there's no way that folks can't feel that because as human beings, we have that emotional response to sincerity, right? So these are elements that we can use when we're engaging challenging conversation. Now, once teachers can understand how to have conversations in their classrooms, conversations in their school buildings that be become you know, a little edgy sometimes, then they'll have the confidence to engage texts and manuscripts, books, et cetera, because then we start to model for them the proper way in which we do history. There's a methodology to history, and as a historian, I recognize that sloppy history is another reason why people argue. Right? There's a method to how you do it. Can, if, if, if we're in a classroom and a student says, um, was Thomas Jefferson a racist? And the teacher's response is, well, yes, he had over 600 uh, enslaved people on his property without, well, that's, now what you're doing is you're, 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 you're pushing your view and, 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 and the way you see things on a student without even, without even attempting to show them how you arrived at that point. So what do you do? You use the methodology of history. You start saying, first of all, what do you mean by racist? Can you define <coughs> racism? What does racism look like now? And was there a racism during the time period in which uh, Jefferson existed, right? Now let's look at the writings of Jefferson. Let's look at his notes on Virginia. Let's look at the things that he made statements about Phyllis Wheatley and others uh, with regard to black people. Now let's take those statements and let's line those up against what the scholars have said are definitions of racism. And then you allow the student to be able to come to their own understanding. Then they will tell you, well, I think he was a racist because of these reasons or not. So at the end of it all, um, you know, the, the method that, that we use is not to directly address the book banning, but what we attempt to do is to give teachers the confidence so that even when they're in a district where they're under pressure, they can feel confident that, no, this is the right book for me to use with my students. It, number one, it's been approved by our, our, our division or there are divisions around us who are using it, but I know how to use this text using the methodology of history and a search for truth to, to spark genuine conversation and for students to, to use inquiry to, to arrive at their learning. If we do that, that sets the groundwork for um, everything that, that's needed when it's time to then deal with the banning of books. The genuine conversation and dialogue and professional learning and listening to teachers and, and yet we are where we are, right? And so, but these all feel like they could be doable if, they're, if we start really centering them or we're putting that first. Um, and I find it fascinating, actually, and I'm curious what, what you guys think as well, but as you're, as you're speaking, Masi, I'm thinking about the dialogue that may not be happening at the school board meetings where there's just someone standing up at a podium quoting kind of ad nauseum from a book they may not have actually fully read, but they've read those particular passages, right? So how do we, 
how do we shift it so there can be that dialogue? I don't know if, if any of you have thoughts on that. I'll, I'll jump in. If I keep jumping in in front of you, you need to kick me. But, um, <laughs> but I, uh, I think one of the ways we're, we're working on this is to try to shift the narrative to talk about the benefits of diverse content. And we, we, have, uh, we ran a study that we just uh, unveiled at uh, CGI, Clinton Global, uh, two weeks ago. And it, it, there was a hole in the data where there wasn't an intensive evaluation of what happens in a classroom when you infuse a classroom library with very high quality, highly diverse content, diverse books. So we selected 450 classrooms across the country, and we did just that. We infused them with beautiful, new, diverse books, and then we stood back and watched what happened over a six-month period. And the results were really compelling. Number one, the collective number of hours the kids in those classrooms read jumped by four hours per week. And number two, their reading scores jumped by three percentage points over the nationally expected averages. And the kids who, are struggle, who were struggling the most in those classrooms were the ones who saw the biggest jumps. Uh, higher still, the classrooms that had bilingual books and LGBTQ books. So what we're trying to do is say, not get into a fist fight, I do my best to avoid fist fights. Good, good. Just want to say that out loud. Uh, but it's, it's really to start saying, why are these important it, it, to kids who are from those underrepresented cultures and to every kid? Because we are in a highly diverse country, a highly diverse, wonderfully diverse world, and we need every child to have that advantage to see themselves, to see other people, to have a bit of understanding and empathy. And so what we learned was that it not only elevated engagement, but it also showed a boost in academics. And I think when we're in a country as we are, where fourth grade reading uh, proficiency scores are tanking, that what we have to do is use a tool that we know works. It's a real power tool, and we have to, you, it's incumbent on us in this crisis to use that power tool in every classroom for every child. And so what we're trying to do is infuse data in, in, about the benefits of these books, the power of these books, in the lives of kids, all kids, uh, but especially with a focus on kids in need since that's our focus population. But that's something we've stepped up Changing with. the narrative there. I think we have to. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Becky. Well, I will say to your point about not getting to fist fights, I, I think most people do try to avoid those. <laughs> I'm relieved and, since yeah. you're within <laughs> swimming distance. <laughs> well, you know, the, the loudest voices tend to be the ones that are heard, but as our executive director at our intermediate unit frequently says, the truth speaks softly. And I think that's something worth remembering in moments like this. Um, our leaders are listening in our districts. They are observing everything and they are trying to be thoughtful and they are trying to be strategic and they are trying to understand that there are so many emotions around these issues, but they ultimately do want to do what is best for students. So when they have to decide what's gonna go in front of students, they need to hear everything. They need to understand the emotions around it, but they need to make the best decisions because of test scores, because of making sure that classrooms are a safe and supportive environment for students. So they're going to sit back, they're going to observe. We have two ears, but one mouth for a reason, right? So they're going to do a lot of listening before they speak up and say things. And it takes a long time for us to come to those decisions about what goes in front of students. 
we need to honor that process and we need to give them time to really think and, and come to a conclusion about what goes in front of students. But ultimately, we need to hear all of the voices. So we need to give our teachers space to be able to talk. We need to give parents space to be able to talk. And we need to hear from students too about what they want to see reflected in their materials because they should have a voice in it as well. And at the end of the day, I think we need to remember that studies do show that when students see themselves reflected in their instructional materials, they connect with the content on a deeper level and that their test scores will increase. So if at the end of the day we want to see student scores increase, we need to make sure that there are diverse resources in front of students. And that doesn't need to be an argument. It doesn't need to be a fight. It needs to be something that is just spoken about in a very logical and practical manner. But it needs to be a conversation. Giving the space for that is reminding me, I wanted to make sure that those of you um, listening and others um, who might know a little bit about New America and our teaching, learning, and tech team know that we have um, a, an initiative that's our inclusive and open education initiative. Ahn Mei Chang is the director, and she and Jasmine Owens, another colleague of mine, have been integral in, in helping us put this event together. And there are several um, reports and research analyses that we've been pulling together over the years in that initiative to show the data and, and the research on what is working for students and what do teachers need. And that's included actually a round table a year or so ago that included youth voice, um, to your point, Becky. And it was, it was really fascinating to hear the, the students talking about what they wish they had more of and wanted more of. And the teachers saying, like, I hear you, but I need to navigate some stuff first. Um, but we just need, yeah, the spaces for the, the students to be able to to, to be heard as well. So I'm gonna take us to one more question and then start thinking about um, in the audience questions that you may have for us as well. But I wanted to take us into that, that digital realm a little bit more for a moment. Um, just recognizing that it's 2023 and that we all, including students, even as young as you know eight and 10 years old, have these things in their hands and they're seeing all sorts of stuff that, um, that others might think they're trying to keep away from them, but they're not necessarily doing so. Um, and, and we are seeing that we can use new technologies to either activate and provide platforms for teachers to learn from each other, for you know, new data to be collected, um, for books that might be banned in one library to be available in an electronic format through apps, for example. A shout out to the Digital Public Library of America that's been working on some projects in that, in that vein. So I wanted to each of you, if you could, to just tell us a little bit about some um, tools or platforms, um, resources that, that you've used in your work that are recognizing kind of the affordances of this, this world. And maybe I'll go, if I can, I might go to you first, Masiahu, because the work that you did in Virginia with many other social studies leaders across the state to um, pull together electronic resources on, on African American history has come to mind for me. I don't know if you might want to describe a little bit of that work to the audience and, and any other tools that you're using as well. Right. Um, well, you know, as the president emeritus of the Virginia Social Studies Leaders Consortium, um, shout out to them. Uh, I know they're watching and that's the premier social studies organization for the state. Um, but a as a part of that organization, I worked with uh, the former uh, president, Bo Dickinson, and I, uh, as the president of the organization, we pulled together um, the uh, organization represents uh, a large swath of the over 100 and uh, 30 uh, divi districts that are in the um, state. We pulled together um, museum um, educators. We pulled together educators from historic locations. We pulled together supervisors from different divisions across Virginia. And we created something called the Dr. Carter G. Woodson Collaborative. And you can look that up and just type in Dr. Carter G. Woodson Collaborative. It'll come right up. Where what we did was we took the technical edits that were done by the African-American uh, Commission on, on History Education 
um, to improve our standards in the state of Virginia. And we, we wanted to show teachers how do you take these edits and turn them into actual lessons that can be used, but having it on an open education resource so it's available to anyone everywhere at all times. And so um, that was a major undertaking, very successful. Uh, we were able to really create some work that teachers enjoyed, appreciated. It's all set, ready to go, click and go. Uh, but then also the opportunity is there for teachers to add on for their specific students, right? To give accommodations to students. But um, th th the purpose of that is that we recognize that the standards in Virginia, the governor recognized, the then governor recognized that the standards were, were lacking in its ability to um, have diverse voices. Um, and so the Dr. Carter G. Woodson Collaborative was, was developed in order to bridge that gap. So, um, you know, I know teachers f as far away as Florida were accessing that information, uh, recognizing that they needed that info themselves. I'd say another thing is that uh, in working with uh, school divisions, developing partnerships with those who create um, you know, online resources, right? Uh, you know, recently uh, one of a retired generals who's a Filipino American uh, developed a, um, a website based upon the duty of serving the country and created this wonderful array of uh, resources to actually engage Asian American voices when we talk about the armed services, when we talk about battles, when we talk about the history of the United States. Um, you know, those kinds of resources are very important to have and link into the uh, pacing uh, and guiding documents for divisions as well. So having online resources readily available, when I was in Richmond Public Schools there as uh, the specialist, we created a website that's still there uh, called growhistoryrps.com uh, in which we put a, a link there for growth and cultivation to help teachers navigate all of these wonderful resources. So. Um, I'm definitely pro digital resource and I think it's, it's wonderful. And I would be remiss if I didn't add, um, you know, that the work that my colleague Annie Evans has, uh, has been doing with D uh, Dr. Ed Ayers um, in their uh, bunk history and the work that they've been doing with history. Um, they've got some wonderful resources with mappings and things that are available to anybody everywhere. Um, so yeah, digital resources are the way to level the playing field. I'll just put out a quick little shout that we have um, a report on the Woodson Collaborative um, within that list of resources um, as well that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So Becky, you. Well, I know I already mentioned them earlier, but OER Commons has been our go-to for all things for teaching and learning. Anytime we have teachers that need resources. Um, in fact, at PAIU at the statewide level, we now have a PAIU hub within that website where our teachers have been going um, oh, I want to say since 2017 now, to curate, collect resources. Each of the intermediate units has a group within our hub, and in fact, we have several work groups that exist there as well. Um, one of our featured work groups is the PA STEM Toolkit, which started as a collaboration between the Pennsylvania Department of Education, PAIU, and then many teachers across the Commonwealth to find resources, connect, collaborate, and the, the hub is the home for everything, but that work group specifically still is being modified, adapted, and reused by educators even today. We are in a process right now where our science standards in the state have been updated to better reflect the NGSS standards. They're not quite exactly the NGSS standards, they're a little more Pennsylvania-centric. However, because of this, we have a whole new implementation cycle going on across the state. And with that, we have a strong OER focus on resources. The resources in our PA STEM toolkit are being realigned. We have open sci ed resources being introduced to teachers across the state. So for us, OER Commons really has sort of been that one-stop shop for teachers to understand, to find resources, to begin to use them. They integrate into several different LMSs, so it's become very versatile for us to say, here's where you're going to go, here's how you can get started. 
However, and they haven't been banned? No, I mean, at all. Is, right? Not at but all. Although the STEM ones, probably not. But no, no actually, um, as we look at it from this science lens now, everybody has been um, very willing to embrace this as a new way to approach teaching and learning, a new way to think about instructional content, instructional materials. And I think it's because it's attached to new standards, because it's a new approach yeah. to instruction, it's something that everyone's willing to say, oh, I need to take a step back because content publishers are not necessarily producing textbooks that are going to meet our needs, but we know that these open educational resources are giving our teachers the flexibility to do what they need to with the standards. So we have some grace right now, and we are definitely leveraging that grace to say, this is something that can work regardless of your instructional initiative. This is not something separate. Open educational resources can support a wide variety of things that you do. Don't look at it as something new. Yeah, yeah the, um, the kind of flexibility within these tools is kind of key too, given, you know, you sort of move on a dime depending on what what the current is out there. So Kyle, I know there are a lot of different sure. kind of tools in your toolbox. There are, there are. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the first book marketplace, right? right? And, and, um, and that's an important one. And I urge you all, if you have a minute, uh, to, to take a look at it. Um, and, uh, but, and, and through the marketplace, we've done with DPLA and New York Public Library and the Obama administration, Remember him? <laughs> Just a minute. But uh, we worked and we launched something called Open eBooks, and it's still going. And we've uh, it was a program with Baker and Taylor and these other uh, great institutions, and we have uh, handed out 8.2 million uh, co individual codes for kids to be able to download up to 10 books at a time for, through Baker and Taylor uh, onto their phones, and so. Uh, you know, we're thrilled about that and thrilled that it's been going over all these years. We run something called the Accelerator, where we listen to our educators, listen to the resources that they feel like they need. So, for example, mental health. Uh, they, they're, they don't feel trained on mental health, understandably. And we reach outside First Book and identify uh, great leading experts on mental health, on how to talk about race and culture in the classroom. And we work with them to create resources that are free and downloadable uh, to our full community. But there's one other thing I want to mention because it, it does have a significant technology element, but it's also something that just gives me hope. And I think we all could probably use a dose of that. And that is, uh, First Book started about a year ago, something called the Diverse Books for All Coalition. And for those of you who work in the nonprofit sector, you realize that collaboration is not something that comes easy in our, in our sector. And uh, it, this has evolved to over 40 organizations that are locking arms. These are all groups that serve zero to eight year olds. They are all locking arms to focus on collective buying, and First Book is racing to build the technology underneath that to make that uh, more seamless. Uh, we are elevating a unified positive narrative that can be shared across the field uh, so that we are using and sharing the same great data that supports the importance of diverse content. And also, the third pillar is uh, to elevate the interaction between parents and caregivers on these issues to provide resources uh, that really, whether they're digital or whether they're traditional print, uh, that will really fuel the discussion. Carrie Kajaki, please raise your <laughs> yes, hand. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, so Carrie uh, is the project director of that coalition. So if there are any hard questions, She's the one who should field them, but uh, I did want to. I did want to. Uh, I just did want to mention that. Yes. No. And in speaking of questions, we're going to go to questions right. from that from the audience online as well as here in the room. Um, so I wanted to see if there's anybody here, and I know Carrie, you might be able to 
provide a little bit more as well, um, and then we'll go to one that's online as well. So let's, if we could um, bring the, the mic here, and then we'll go to a question online on May, if you've got one. Questions. Two questions online? Okay. So. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Great. Thanks for the setup, Kyle. Wonderful. Yes, and please introduce yourself and just be super, super succinct. Wonderful. I'm Carrie Kerjack. I am the project director of the Diverse Books for All Coalition. Um, we have a lot of collaborative efforts happening right now around that collective purchasing, purchasing 600,000 copies of diverse titles in the next year and a half. Um, so as we're talking about more collaboration, I'm wondering for the other two panelists, what are opportunities that you guys have found for collaboration around these efforts? And then for all the panelists, maybe um, to address who are we missing at the table and who can really help elevate this conversation further? Oh, thanks. That's a great question. Um, so within the state of Pennsylvania, because we have 29 intermediate units, we have what are called job-alike groups, and those job-alike groups are individuals that have similar jobs that meet regularly throughout the year, and that's our opportunity to collaborate. So we all come together, and I actually just sat on two different meetings within the last couple weeks for the curriculum coordinators and then for the instructional media specialists. Um, and that's really our opportunity to come together, collaborate, see what is going on at the state level across all districts, what everybody needs and how we can work together to provide supports statewide. And then that is actually how we started to create our PAIU hub years ago on OER Commons because we noticed a trend where multiple districts were asking about open educational resources and we started researching where would be a place where we could have a common housing unit for all of these things that our teachers need. So anytime we start to have those conversations about what are our teachers asking, what do they need, mm -hmm. we find different places, different vendors, different locations, different whatever the case may be, and that's where we start to investigate as a group together to see what the need is, what are the resources available to us, and then we start having those conversations at a bigger level to say, okay, where do we wanna move forward? Who do we want to involve in that conversation? And that's how things really start to work through our job alike groups. Well, for the, um, the Virginia Social Studies Leaders Consortium, uh, we partner with, uh, matter of fact, when the standards battle was, was in, in place in Virginia, the Virginia Social Studies Leaders Consortium partnered with American Historical Association along with um, the VASCD. Um, and those three organizations, we put together a new set of standards to, to rival the standards that came out that they, we didn't feel were the best standards for our students. Uh, within those organizations, there are regional organizations that also have um, not just state, but, but um, national uh, you know, versions of the organization. So the Virginia Council for the Social Studies is, is, is a partner, and then they're a part of the National Council for the Social Studies. You know, Virginia ASCD is a part of the ASCD D nationally. So all of those organizations meet um, with, with uh, subcommittees on a regular basis. So for example, we just had uh, Arlington Public Schools um, Fairfax County Public Schools, Loudoun County, like all of those uh, uh, schools in that region, they get together and meet several times within the course of a semester to talk about these exact issues. So being a part of the Virginia Social Studies Leaders Consortium really provides a networking capability all the way to the national level with regard to social studies education, which I might add is the linchpin in all of this conversation. Right, because if we had the proper historical lens and the understanding of the history, then a lot of the issues and problems that folks find with certain texts could either be navigated through conversation or we wouldn't be having those problems at all if we really knew the history. Let's go to a couple more questions. Yes. And just state your name and then your question. Hi, I'm Carrie Albinick. Um, I listen to these conversations and it sounds like we're often comparing political and religious ideology over data or social mobility, and that feels like apples to oranges. 
how do we as stakeholders uh, in policy or even just in education make that a bit more linear and also take the onus off of teachers who already have a thousand things to do? Yeah, any of you want to take that? There's a lot packed into that question. <laughs> well, first you subscribe to the Leading by History podcast. <laughs> That's number one. And, and we'll get you straight on all of the things that you don't have time to cover in the, in the meanwhile. Uh, but I think it's, it's important to realize that um, the conversation is never going to really be linear, right? There, there's always going to be, as long as you have human beings, we have culture inside of culture, you have language, you have music, you have religion, right? So we are complex entities as human beings. So the conversations will always be complex, even though the linear route would seem the most reasonable and help us cut through all of the stuff. One of my former superintendents used to always say, let's keep the main thing, the main thing. What happens is we're not keeping the main thing the main thing. See, it's okay if there are intersections of identity, whether it be religion, whether it be race, whether it be uh, someone's gender identity, right? Like those, those complexities exist, but then what are we focused on looking at from those different identities? And I think that's what you're getting to with your question. Like how, what is the main thing and how do we stay focused on it, right? The main thing is the children. And, and a lot of times we hear it's a cliche, we got to do what's best for kids. Well, when's the last time you've talked to one? When's the last time you've engaged with a student? You know, you see these um, uh, leaders of, of divisions and they always want the good camera shot when they're going to visit a school and they find the school where all the students that have challenges are out for the day. Uh, they find the classroom where there's nothing, you know, really controversial going on. And then we get the photo opportunity, right? And a lot of times they, the, the, we see the political leaders and those in charge telling themselves because you, all you have to do is look at the face of the kids, look at the face of the students in those, in those photo ops. And I, I've seen a photo op recently, I won't say who, when, when and where, but they were trying to promote this particular thing, like look at what we're doing. And I'm looking and they're, the black kid in the back, Asian kids just like, you know. So it was just like, it, it, was, it was clear, but the, they were smiling, right? We've lost what the main thing is, which is our students, right? And what are students asking for, right? I'll say this, because I want to make sure I get this in before we end today. I think about an episode of Good Times, which is my family's favorite show to watch. And I remember the episode where Michael, who's always the revolutionary, right? The sole brother of the family. He obtains a, a picture of a black Jesus and he puts it up on the wall and his mother comes home and says, what have you done? Don't you dare move my, my white Jesus on the wall or whatever. And he starts to quote biblical scripture, Revelations chapter one. It says that Jesus was black, you know, and when they got to the end of the episode, we found out that it was a picture of Ned the wino. <laughs> Right? It was Ned the Wino's picture. But for Michael, that didn't matter because he had a craving to see himself in his religious expression. So what is Michael asking for? And what, what did his mother do? Even though she had the hardcore white Jesus on the wall, she said, you know what? You can leave him up for Black History Month. But then after that, he's got to come back down. I tell that story because Michael didn't care that it was Ned the Wino's image. It was the image of a black man. And that black image did something to him psychologically that made him feel a belonging and a sense of, of restoration in his spiritual understanding. And his mother allowed him to have that space, right? So if we get back to answering your question, which is why I went through this whole barnyard discussion, <laughs> is that at the end of it all, what are the students telling us, right? Amongst the Maasai warriors, they don't just say, how are you doing, what's happening? They say, how are the children? And I think that's, what, that's the main thing where we can take all these identities and, and, and you know, multiple perspectives to focus back on that main thing. And I, I think that's me for the e evening, but go ahead. <laughs> yes. I, one, one last question from online, um, which takes us actually back to the first panel too as well. So. Um, here's the question. Uh, Matsuyahu talked about empowering teachers to have difficult conversations with confidence. 
Uh, in the first panel, Ravita talked about parents pushing for bans when they were not ready to have difficult conversation. Is there something the education system should do to help prepare parents for these difficult, uh, different conversations? Mm. I'll, I'll step up and say yes. <laughs> um, I think that, I think it's critical and I think we've got to stop being afraid. And, and I think this is one of the reasons why I want to infuse data into these conversations. Parents should should receive the data that First Book has, and we're not alone in this, the data that is supporting uh, the, the need for diverse books, the need for diverse resources. And, you know, I, I ran a completely uh, meatball experiment for about two months. Every time I was on a conference call, a Zoom call, and there would be 15 or 20 people, you, you were, you're all on these, right? <laughs> Right. In fact, I wanted to congratulate you all for remembering to wear pants today. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but every time I was on one of those calls, and these are mostly progressive people who are deeply involved with education. This is where, you know, I, we're spending our lives. And I would say at the first part of the call, I just want 60 seconds to say, raise your hand if you have called a, a teacher or a principal or a school district, raise your hand and tell me what happened. And you know what? Not one time did anyone raise their hands, not one time. And these are activists, these are people like me, devoting decades of our lives to these issues. And, and I probably did it 20 times, 20 of these questions, right? And, and that it was deeply troubling to me because I thought, if these people are not picking up the phone, then what's going on with the parents? And you know, and you don't have to have a child in that school. You don't have to. You can live in that community and know that this is important. So I do think this has to, this action oriented, we have to get people ready to pick up the phone and be heard because what's happening in these schools is the principal is sitting there and he or she gets five phone calls from people shrieking, and that is the appropriate word, uh, about pornography or whatever, right? And they've got that on one side of the ledger, and they've got dead silence on the other side. And that is on all of us. We have got to change that dynamic. And they've got, so we've got to get the data out there. We've got to share data. And we've got to make it happen because the silence is killing us. Rubia, Call to can action I to ask end. you to answer yeah. that question, having yes. the parent group? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Sure. Yeah. What's, what can the education system do to help parents get ready for these conversations? You know, I, I think that's... It, it really comes from the inside or, you know, kind of like you mentioned, um, having that. I don't know if the, the teachers and the, the district can promote the conversation. I think they can also, they can ask you to be forthcoming and welcoming in asking those questions. But similar to what Kyle said, I think the onus is on us. We have to be engaged. We can't sit around quietly and um, not have the conversation. So one of the things that One Will Co. has been doing is creating uh, parent uh, cluster groups so that we can go out and have relationships and promote the conversations with the staff in the building and let them know that we are a grassroots organization. We're open uh, to these conversations and we've actually had some of our uh, district reach out to us about solution or problems that they're having and ask for resources. So all the information that you've shared, the resources, I got all of them open on my phone <laughs> <laughs> so I can use them later. But we have right. to open up that um, line of communication to be able to have the difficult conversations and to have the conversations that we're scared about. But mm -hmm. I think the, the way to do that is just being transparent and being vulnerable. You know, I don't know everything, you don't either, but don't get mad at me for asking the question, but help me figure out the yeah. answer. Yeah. Right. Love that. I think that's a great way to end it. I just want to say a huge thank you to our panel, to the first panel, to Joe Wilkes and everyone on the thread, um, and to my colleagues at New America, but mostly to all of you for being here with us. So let's give a round of applause and a big thank you. And to our online audience. So thanks, everyone. Have a great night.